the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you laid down your life that i would be set I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of Glory, the King of Glory. the nations with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross, you lay down your life, that I would be set free, oh Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me, worthy is the Lamb who was slain, worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You laid down your life that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Good morning, everybody. Those of you who are in our church building, a very, very warm welcome to you. Uh, particularly a warm welcome to those who may be visiting with us today as you are celebrating along with Max Boyd's family. Today is a very special day for Max. It's the day of his baptism. Hiya, Max. <laughs> Good boy. I'm getting, I don't know if he's waving at me or not, but he's wave, uh, waving and I'm waving back. <laughs> Uh, this is a very, very important event for Max, and it's also a reminder to us of the joy of belonging to Jesus Christ and the joy of being church. If you are at home or if you are here, may you know the joy and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not going to labour on announcements, uh, just to say a couple of things. Uh, first of all, our prayer event, which is coming up uh, next Sunday, we're going to have a service on the theme of our prayer event. 
uh, and we'll work our way towards it. The prayer event will then happen on the Friday and Saturday at the end of that week. Uh, please do uh, contact our prayer team to get access to the materials for our prayer event. There's some wonderful materials have been produced in-house for you for the prayer event. You receive them by emailing Kilbride together in prayer at gmail.com. We want everybody to be involved in this. A praying church is a living church. We are not a religious society or club. We are those who depend on the life of Jesus Christ. And so uh, we pray. You might not be able to commit yourself to taking an hour slot in a prayer event. And so we're not saying you don't pray, but we encourage you to. And please also let us be those who seek the heart of the Lord together. If you can, uh, sign up to our prayer event. Take one of the slots as we seek to have 40 hours consecutive praying about the life of our church and as we seek to reopen our activities in coming months. A very complicated project. So our prayer event, so very important. And to reassure families, this isn't only for those who are adults. Materials have also been produced to help children be involved in this prayer event. Now, if you've got a four-year-old child, don't worry, they're not required to take an hour-long slot in the prayer event. <laughs> but there is an activity for them to help them in their praying and to help you teach them. Also, next Sunday, we have another special Sunday. Uh, we will be having communion again. We were so thrilled with the enthusiasm there was to come to the Lord's table together last month. And so we encourage you to come along again on the 20th of June for our next communion Sunday. If you just haven't got around to saying to me yet, but you really do want to, then I would encourage you to speak to me as soon as possible. If you wish to have my help in becoming a communicant member of our congregation. There'll be no pressure. Once you start a conversation, that doesn't mean you're in the railway tracks and you're going. We can take as long as you need to talk. But I'm here to help. I'll leave you to look through all the remaining announcements. I don't want to take further time away from Graham. Two things about Graham before he starts. First of all, yesterday was his birthday. Secondly, his car broke down on the way here today. And so Graham needs our love, our support, and our warm hearts as we listen to him today. Graham, may the peace of God be with you. Good morning, everybody. It's brilliant to be with you. And thank you, Yule, for the kind uh, lift in here today. Um, I broke down on the way in. But it's brilliant to be with you, to worship alongside you today, and especially welcome the families of, of um, Deborah and David as, as we celebrate Max's back baptism today. You're especially welcome here today to worship alongside us. God calls us to worship using the words of Psalm 29 and verses 10 and 11. The Lord rules over the floodwaters. The Lord reigns as king forever. The Lord gives his people strength. The Lord blesses them with peace. Let's praise the Lord, who not only rules over the earth and reigns as king forever, but who strengthens his people, blessing them with peace. Let's worship our living God, living God our living God of peace, by singing, Because He Lives.
let's, let's join together in prayer. Let us pray. God of peace, we praise you because you give us peace. And we thank you for the peace that you give us through our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We confess that in our own nature, we are not people of peace. Forgive us for the times that we have chosen hostility, or conflict, and enmity instead of your perfect peace. Your word reminds us that when our minds are focused on the flesh, we are hostile toward you, not submitting ourselves to your ways, unable to please you, unable in our natural state to be at peace with you. In our sin, we declare war upon you, but through the cross, you, Jesus, you make peace for those who rebel against you. Thank you, Jesus. You are our Prince of Peace. And by trusting in you, we can find peace with God. Thank you that while we were still sinners, hostile toward you, in enmity with you, you sent your one and only Son to live a perfect, sinless life and die on a cross so that we could know your forgiveness. Thank you that as he ascended, he sent his advocate, the Holy Spirit, so that we could experience and express the peace that you offer us through your son. Bring your peace through the presence of your Holy Spirit as we worship you and as we praise your name today and every day. And it's in Jesus' name, our pre Prince of Peace, that we ask all of these things. Amen. As I say, it's great to be with you again this morning. And before Gareth comes and conducts Max's baptism, we're going to have our first reading. And our first reading is taken from John chapter 14. And we're reading from verses 15 to 27. That's John chapter 14, verses 15 to 27. And this is all about what Jesus leaves us with, his perfect peace. Let's read God's word together. John chapter 14, verses 15 to 27. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father... And he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you will also live. On that day that you, you will realize that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas, Judas Iscariot, said, but Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all these things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave you with, and my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. 
And we end our reading there at verse 27. And we thank God for his living word. Well, thank you, Graham. And it's very good to have you in Kilbride this morning. I hope you know our love and our support. And it's also very good to have Max here. Hiya. He's a lovely, lovely boy. And so we have Deborah and David up here along with their son, Max. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. God has given us the sacrament of baptism. It is a symbol of the cleansing of sin that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Those who believe in Jesus have salvation in his name, bought by his death on the cross. And Jesus has told us this is not a private thing. This is to be shared. And the symbol of it is to be shared. For he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And so Max is too young to fully understand what I'm about to do this morning. But we know that what we do is we are applying the symbol of him belonging to the covenant community of faith in Jesus Christ, the church. He is to be raised as one in Christ's ways. He is to be taught the faith that he might claim this faith for himself. He is not an outsider to us. He is an insider to us. He belongs. He belongs to the church of Jesus Christ. And that's what baptism is. Jesus loves our children. And he taught his own disciples that. He said to them that they were to receive such as Max. You'll know the story, won't you? The time that Jesus picked up the children and blessed them. And his disciples scowled at those who brought them. We welcome ones like Max. And so today, as Deborah and David stand... I'm going to ask them a couple of questions. They're going to give their answers to the questions. I'm going to ask you to stand with them because I'm going to ask you a question also as a congregation. We are Christ's church. We take vows that declare our faith. Let's do it together. And so just to, just to help you out, Deborah and David, the answer to your questions are I do. Uh, yeah, no, <laughs> I believe so. And, and congregation, the answer to your question is we do. Okay, so say it nicely whenever it comes to your turn. And so I ask these lovely parents, in presenting your child Max for baptism today, do you confess your faith in God as your heavenly father? In Jesus Christ as your Saviour and Lord, and in the Holy Spirit as your sanctifier and guide. And do you promise independence on divine grace, which means with God's help, to teach your child the truths and duties of the Christian faith, and by your prayers, teaching and example, to bring up Max in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and in the ways of the church of God. Good answers. Now, this is not just something that affects this family. Remember I said baptism is a symbol of belonging to the church of Jesus Christ. And so church, you have vows also. Do you who now in Christ's name receive this child into the fellowship of the church, promise by the grace of God to guard the truth of God, to live in the faith of the gospel, and to love one another, so that this child and all others among you may grow up to love and serve our Lord Jesus Christ. 
That's also a good answer. Thank you. Properly said. May the Lord give you and you the grace to keep the vows you have taken. Now, we are still in the pandemic. And so, those of you who know how a baptism goes, it is different at the moment. This is not my new way of doing it. This is the way it is done at the moment. It will also be lovely. It is also properly a baptism. Uh, but David is going to keep holding Max, and David is going to lean Max over towards me, and I will apply the water of baptism by pouring. That's how today it is to be done. And so, when I do that, I know I'm sorry, Max, you're going to get wet. And as I do this, I now declare before I do it that I baptize Max in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray for this lovely couple, but first we will sing together the ironic blessing over him. Let us pray. Lord God, we have sung a prayer, a blessing over Max and his mother and father. We celebrate this beautiful life that is within him today. We celebrate the goodness that there is from husband and wife in love together and mother and father to son. Lord, we pray your deep and lasting blessing on Deborah, on David, and on Max. Keep this little boy well. Grant wisdom and patience and peace and goodness to Deborah and to David as they parent. Grant your lasting love and patience and goodness and kindness and good positive influences to all the family circle. May this boy indeed be raised in the ways of Jesus Christ and within the community of his church. Help this family to do it well and help us, your church, to connect with this family and to do it well, to surround them, to support them, to pray for them, to love them. Might we indeed receive this boy as Christ tells us to. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as little Max, who will receive love willingly, openly, innocently. May we all do so with faith in Christ, our Savior. In his name we pray. Amen. And so before the service, I set a lovely little Bible for Max. Uh, this is going to help 
Deborah and David fulfill their vows of raising Max in the ways of Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you. Thank you so much. <laughs> you better not give it back to him. <laughs> You're a good boy. God bless you. We sing our next praise, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. As we continue to worship together, let's join our hearts again in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, thank you for leaving us with your Spirit so that we could too could experience peace with God and experience peace toward those around us. And as we pray for ourselves and for others, we pray that you would bring us your peace as we minister among this community. Lord, we pray that as the marching season approaches, we pray that you would bring your peace here in Northern Ireland, especially in light of recent violence on our streets again. Thank you for all the work that you are doing through Presbyterian congregations in these frontline 
areas of conflict. Help them by your spirit as they continue to help their community to deal with these challenging and difficult times. Grant them your peace by the presence of your spirit so that they can express this peace in the midst of the conflict that surrounds them. We also pray for the people of Myanmar at this time. We pray for a just and peaceful resolution to the ongoing civil unrest following the military coup earlier this year. Lord, bring the peace that you can only bring to that land. We pray for the leaders and the members of the Presbyterian Church in Myanmar at this difficult time as they continue to proclaim the peace that only Christ gives us in the midst of hostility. We also pray for the work of Mission Aviation Fellowship at this time as they deliver vaccines and other supplies to remote af areas of Africa. Be with them on their journeys. We pray and provide them with the materials they need to do their job and provide for those in need and who aren't at peace. Finally, we give you thanks for our ministry team and volunteers here in Kilbride. Thank you for Gareth and James as they have continued to minister to your people throughout these tough times. Grant them your peace and your refreshment during these summer months. We also thank you for the volunteers uh, in a variety of organizations that are happening over the summer. We pray especially for those who are on the prayer team as they organize our prayer event. Grant them your peace in the planning and during those 40 hours may we encounter you and the peace that you give to us. And during those 40 hours, um, we pray for the, that peace. And we also pray for volunteers in our summer kids activities as well. Thank you for all those who contribute to our Holiday Bible Club. We pray that many children would come to know you and the peace that you offer to your children by your spirit. And we pray for the Boyd family today as we welcome them into our church family. Grant them your peace, we pray as they bring Max up in the ways of your son. And it's in his name, the one who brings us peace, that we ask all of these things. Amen. Our second reading today is taken from Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 to 9. That's Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 to 9. Let, let's read God's word together. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with Yodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose, name, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, Whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learnt or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. And we end our reading there at verse 9. Just before we think about this a little more, let's join our hearts in prayer. Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, grant us peace as we listen to you speak today. Still the hostile noise buzzing through our minds and draw close to us through your Son, our Prince of Peace, Jesus. Speak to us through your word and by your spirit. It's in Jesus' name that we ask all of these things. Amen. Peace. Peace is a word that each of us hear a lot, especially here in Northern Ireland, isn't it? There are peace walls, peace bridges, peace processes. But do all these things truly bring peace? Yes, all of these things have been effective tools in common hostility. Yes, we've taken great steps forward. But there's something about this world that will always have hostility. It feels that there will always be bitterness, that there will always be bickering, always something to fight about. There's so much conflict in this world. We regularly pray as a church for peace in places of conflict. But in our praying, are we praying for the peace of God or just calming hostility? We need peace. We all know that. We all strive toward that. But have we been in pursuit of real peace? Have we been seeking after the peace that comes from God? Over the past few weeks, we've been journeying through the fruits of the Spirit. And Galatians 5, 22 and 23 reminds us that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Today, we will be looking at what it means to have the fruit of the Spirit, peace. But from the outset, it's good to remind ourselves that the peace of God comes to us through the presence of the God of peace. That is our main point today. The peace of God comes to us through the presence of the God of peace. Earlier on, we read from Philippians. And when Paul is writing this letter to the church, he's not in a place of tranquility. He isn't sitting beside a calm river, skimming stones as he pens these words. He isn't in a nice coffee shop sipping artisanal flat whites and eating nice tray bakes. In fact, Paul is writing to the church in Philippi from the confinement of a prison cell. From his cold prison cell, he writes this letter to the church and it's full of golden nuggets of verses that people have memorized. And the downside to this is that lots of these verses are detached from the big picture surrounding them. And often when we think of these popular verses in isolation, we can often feel or, or sort of change ourselves of what Paul is actually saying. And sometimes we can be ignorant of what the Holy Spirit is communicating to us through his word today. The Philippian church were living in a very intense area where lots of voices were fighting for atten the attention of God's people in that place and in that time. These people were being oppressed by an intensely powerful Roman Empire. And as well as this, there were many people who would preach about Jesus, but their purposes and intentions, well, they, they weren't up to scratch. And the purpose of this letter is to draw people of Philippi back to Jesus, even though they faced much suffering and much persecution in the midst of these conflicting voices and oppressive powers, Paul is drawing his people back to Jesus so that they can know the peace that he brings, even in the midst of chaos and suffering. In the early verses of this book, Paul tackles one of these issues, the issue of people preaching with bad intentions. And when he provides a response to this challenge, he just says, what does it matter? And when we look at this response in isolation, it can feel as if Paul is just waving his white flag. It feels as if just Paul is just resigning his zeal in exchange for peace while he's in prison. 
It feels as if the wind is out of Paul's seal, as if he's accepting the fact that things just won't go right for him, and there's nothing that he can do about it. Whatever will be, will be. Whatever happens, happens. It feels as if Paul is just at peace with it. Toward the end of last week, my car broke down, and that really took the wind out of my sails. And before that, um, the, I felt that the wind was at my back. I felt that I was learning a lot while ministering amongst you in Kilbride. And a few days later, I didn't feel too well. And given the situation, I had to assess everything with the necessary precautions. And thankfully, it wasn't coronavirus. But whatever it was, it really took the wind out of my sails. And as I looked for some temporary comfort, as I was worried about the mechanics bill, um, and as I still am, um, <laughs> and whatever was going on in my body, I sighed and I said, I'm just going to have to be at peace with it. Just so that I could have some temporary comfort. But the peace that I was talking about wasn't really peace at all. Sometimes in the midst of difficult or challenging times, when we face trials and suffering, we will do or say anything to have peace, won't we? When we're unwell, maybe some of us tell others that we're just fine. Maybe sometimes when things start going badly, when trials in our lives come, it can be so easy to resign our zeal, our passion just for a bit of peace. But in our resignation to hostility, we don't find peace. When we resign ourselves to hostility, we don't find peace. When we give in to the suffering we're experiencing, resigning ourselves to whatever happens, we might see a calming of the hostility around us, but we do not find peace. Whilst our resignation might give us a sense of temporary comfort in the midst of struggles, it doesn't give us a permanent sense of peace. You see, the fruit of the Spirit that is peace isn't just a temporary sense of com comfort in the midst of trials. It is a secure, resilient peace. And Paul had a permanent sense of peace. And this permanent sense of peace comes from God. The peace of God comes to us through the presence of the God of peace. The peace of God comes to us through the presence of the God of peace. But how do we get this sense of peace? Because in our own nature, permanent peace seems pretty unreachable. Maybe it comes from what Paul reminds us in Philippians chapter 4. To set our mind on good things, to meditate on what's true, what's noble, what's pure, what's lovely, what's admirable, what's excellent, and what's praiseworthy. Maybe if we work really, really hard on thinking really hard on these things all the time, then we'll experience peace. But just as Paul tells us those things, we're reminded of the times where our minds are not filled with what is true. We're reminded of the times where we set our minds on things that weren't noble, that weren't pure, that weren't lovely, that weren't admirable, excellent or praiseworthy in our own nature we set our minds on things that are in opposition to truth nobility purity and loveliness the bible tells us that each of us are born into sin and in our own nature our minds are set on things of the flesh things that are hostile toward god and the very the start of the big story of the Bible begins in a garden where humanity lived in perfect peace with God. They walked with each other, talked with each other. God and man experienced a perfect relationship with each other without hostility toward each other. But Eve chose to elevate herself so that she could possess the knowledge and wisdom and be like God. And this fight for authority brought hostility between humans and their creator, breaking this perfect relationship. And as sin enters the world, generation 
after generation after generation continue to be born in opposition to God, far from being at peace with him. And when we recognize this in our own lives, in ourselves, and long for this peace with God again, oftentimes we can think that if we work really hard on ourselves, if we go to church, if we volunteer in organizations, try really hard to find peace with God, we feel the guilt and admit it, and we try really hard to make it our job to fix it. We think, maybe if I work really hard at being a good person, then God will see that and make peace with me. Maybe this is because there's no sense of peace, like a job completely finished. When we work really hard on something and we have that peace of a job that's well done. Maybe it's a fence that you've finally finished painting and you take a step back and you think it's a job well done. Maybe it's the grass that's been freshly mowed or a DIY project that's been finished once and for all after sitting in the box for just about 12 months since last Christmas. But one thing that interrupts this sense of peace is someone coming along, inspecting every fencing panel, every blade of grass, every screw in the packet of flat packed furniture, and examining the work that you've finally finished. When I'm at home, this is always my brother's job. Just as you've finished the job at hand, he's always the one to come in and say, you've missed a bit. And that sense of peace is always interrupted when you hear the words, you've missed a bit. I wouldn't want to be painting the Golden Gate Bridge when my brother's around. Apparently, the painting of the Golden Gate Bridge has never been completely finished. It's constantly being worked on, painted, to maintain its iconic color. And when we r really work hard on finding peace with God, when we try really hard to put a lick of paint over the cracks in our lives, we will always fall short. We'll always miss a bit. We'll never finish the job, no matter how hard we try and present ourselves well, to cover the cracks in our broken lives. There's nothing we can do in our own strength to find peace with God. But there is another way. You see, the peace of God comes to us through the God of peace. Finding the peace of God is the great reward of coming into relationship with Jesus. Jesus, by living a perfect life, dying on the cross, and being raised to life again makes a way for those who are in their own nature hostile toward God to find peace with God. Earlier on in our service of worship, we read from John chapter 14. And in this passage, Jesus is speaking to his disciples just before he takes our sins on the cross, raises himself from the grave and ascends into heaven. And as Jesus speaks about finishing his time on earth with his disciples, he promises to leave them with something so that they can continue to be his disciples. And that thing is peace. You see, through his death on the cross, Jesus brings those who believe in him into a peaceful relationship with God. And as he leaves us with his Holy Spirit, and as he ascends into heaven, we experience this real, this perfect, and this permanent peace as the Holy Spirit dwells inside of us. If you want to experience this peace as a fruit of the Spirit in your life, you can. Today, if you want to, you can lay down your hostility toward God. You can turn away from your sin leaving behind your old life that was in opposition to him and embrace the new life that he offers, a life of peace when you put your hope and your faith and your trust in Jesus. He will embrace you and you can enjoy peace with God and experience this peace as a fruit of the Spirit living inside you. And this peace 
is the peace that Paul is talking about in Philippians 4. And it's the same peace that Jesus left us with by his Holy Spirit. The peace of God. But it's important to remember that this peace isn't given to us at a distance. Jesus doesn't leave us and then, as an afterthought, throw peace at us from far away. This peace comes to us as we come into an intimate relationship with our Prince of Peace. Through our relationship with Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us. And to give us peace by his divine presence. And this is true in what Paul says in Philippians 4. Just as Paul tells us to not be anxious, but to turn to God in prayer. He says that the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard us, heart and mind, in Jesus. And just as Paul reminds us to be obedient to what we have been taught, setting our lives upon what is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, and admirable, things. He reminds us that the God of peace is with us as we put these things into practice. What he is saying here is that the peace of God comes to us through the presence of the God of peace. And no matter what we face, when we commit our lives to Jesus, communicating our anxieties to him in prayer, putting into practice what he is teaching us, his peace is present with us and he remains present with us as well. Whatever our circumstances, whatever our status is before others, whatever our financial status, our health status, our sense of authority, the Christian has peace because their status before God is clean because of Jesus. This is not a peace that gives us a temporary satisfaction or sense of comfort. This is resilient peace. Paul, while still in chains, can truly say that he can do all things through Christ who gives him strength. Paul was in chains. He was hungry. He was cold. He was suffering. And yet he believed that he could endure the worst of it. Because it was the God of peace who strengthened him. Because he had the peace of God through the presence of the God of peace. He could firmly say that I could do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And whatever the circumstances that he faced, he could say that he is content. Because he knew that the peace of God was with him through the presence of the God of peace. In spite of the difficulties that we face, whatever trials that we are going through, we too can say these things when we believe and trust in Jesus. Because the peace of God comes to us through the God of peace and the presence of the God of peace when we put our hope and our trust in Jesus. And that is the peace that we have prayed and sang over the Boyd family as they ha we have welcomed them into our church, that they would find the peace of knowing Jesus in their family and they, as they have committed their family life to him. The fruit of the Spirit is peace. We all can experience this peace with God by coming into relationship with Jesus. And you can express this peace in your life as the Holy Spirit lives and dwells in you. You can say that you are at peace with God by believing and trusting in Jesus. The peace of God comes to you through the presence of the God of peace. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, today we place our trust again in our Savior Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for making us at peace before you. Because while we were still sinners, you died for us. We believe in you and invite the Holy Spirit to live and to dwell within us. 
by your spirit, transform us so that we can bear the fruit of your peace in our lives. Not only so that we can experience this peace, but express it in front of those around us. Help us by your spirit to communicate this peace that not only you bring to others, but you bring to us. Help us by your spirit to communicate the peace that only you bring to others so that your presence within us is evident to all around. Help us to experience your peace and to express it to everyone that we encounter. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Let's conclude today's service of worship by singing, Let the peace of God reign. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.
ที